Hey guys, it's Greg with Apple Explained, and today we're going to explore the history of the iPod Touch. This topic was the winner of last week's voting poll, and if you didn't get to vote, make sure you're subscribed. That way the voting polls will show up right in your activity feed, and you can let me know which video you'd like to see next. So today I'm going to talk about the iPod Touch, the only iPod model you can buy today. We'll explore why it was developed and why it's still being sold when all the other iPod models have been discontinued. The story of the iPod Touch begins in 2007. By that time, iPods had been around for quite a while, with the first version released in 2001. And by 2007, Apple had already released a number of different models, some discontinued and some still being sold. There was the iPod Classic, iPod Mini, iPod Nano, iPod Shuffle, and iPod Photo. While Apple definitely had a secure footing in the market, competitors were starting to pop up. Zune had just released its first model of MP3 player and was about to release the Zune 80, Zune 4, and Zune 8, competition for the iPod Classic and Nano lines. Luckily, Apple had something up their sleeve. Now, the iPhone had already been on the market for about 18 months in September of 2007. It was wildly popular, with lines hundreds of people long outside Apple stores on the day of its release. Part of its success was the touchscreen interface, which up until that point really hadn't been utilized by mobile phone manufacturers. Users were excited about a new, sleek, and attractive design that really seemed to be the future of technology. But there were some problems with the iPhone. For example, many of the people who bought them in the first few days of release were disappointed to find out that they couldn't really activate them. AT&T's servers were just too overwhelmed to handle the number of new iPhones. Others were frustrated that the only way to actually use an iPhone was to purchase a bundled plan with AT&T, which meant leaving their own service provider and paying high costs to a new company that often didn't have as reliable coverage. And finally, there was the cost. The first iPhone cost $499 for a 4GB model and $599 for an 8GB model, and this was a problem. People wanted the touchscreen, they wanted the apps, and they wanted the design, but the cost of an iPhone was just too high. And that's where the iPod Touch came in. Shortly after the iPhone 3G was released, the iPod Touch was introduced and served as an affordable alternative to the iPhone. Its price began at $299 for an 8GB model, $399 for 16GB, and eventually $499 for 32GB. The only features that were missing were phone capabilities, a camera, and a GPS radio. This first generation offered quite a bit to users. Along with the ability to store and play music, the first generation iPod allowed users to access wireless internet, download and play video, and download interactive apps. Users could easily browse YouTube, Safari, and the calendar, as well as access their contacts. Another difference between the iPod Touch and the iPhone was its design. The iPod Touch was thinner and lighter, coming in at only 8mm thin instead of 11.6mm with the iPhone. The biggest change, though, was the introduction of the wireless iTunes Store. Users could now download songs directly onto their iPod from anywhere with Wi-Fi access. This feature was a big deal, since it eliminated the need to transfer songs that were purchased from a computer. This was actually such an exciting concept that many big companies wanted to jump in. For example, Starbucks made special playlists that, when connected to their in-store Wi-Fi, were easy to access and download onto your iPod Touch with just a few taps. But of course, the first generation of iPod Touch would eventually be improved upon as technology advanced, and the second generation iPod Touch was released just a year later in 2008. The new model introduced Bluetooth technology and included something called Genius as a feature in iTunes. This generation was also even more affordable than the last, only $299 for a 16GB model and $399 for 32GB. The third generation was quick to follow in 2009, and not much changed besides the addition of a microphone and speaker. At this point, all three generations of iPod Touch had been using the same LED backlit LCD display at 163 pixels per inch. But that was about to change in 2010 with the fourth generation model, which brought some big updates to the iPod Touch. There was the addition of a Retina display, which improved screen resolution to 326 pixels per inch, an accelerometer and three-axis gyroscope that allowed for position recognition, which was great for gaming apps, front and rear-facing cameras, and finally, there was the big redesign. The iPod Touch got even thinner and did away with the plastic antenna on the back of the case. 
As games and other apps became more popular on the iPod, Apple recognized the need to make some even bigger updates, and probably one of the most important changes about the fourth generation iPod Touch was the cameras. It could now take photos and videos and utilize apps like FaceTime. All of these additions made the motto, iPhone without the phone, really start to take hold. Now, it's worth mentioning that the supposed iPod killer, the Microsoft Zune, wasn't doing too well. In early 2011, Microsoft announced that there wouldn't be any new updates to the line and cited none other than the iPod for its failure in succeeding during its five years on the market. Later that year, the official discontinuation of Zune products was announced. Apple had officially won the battle for the music player market, and the iPod Touch was a big part of that success. So with that tailwind at Apple's back, the next generation of iPod Touch was released in October 2012. And at this point, the iPod Touch was no longer receiving annual updates, and the lines at Apple stores for the newest iPod Touch were getting shorter. The reason being that the rise in iPhone's popularity was essentially cannibalizing sales of the iPod Touch. But that didn't stop Apple from updating the device as it was still a vital part of their product lineup. So Greg Joswiak unveiled the iPhone 5 and then moved on to reveal the new iPod Touch and discussed all the features they had in common. It had the same dual-core chip from the iPhone 4S with an updated GPU. It had the same IPS retina display as the iPhone 5. The new camera was new and improved to shoot 1080p video and it ran iPhone 6 which supported Siri. At this point, the price dropped even lower. Buyers could now get a 32GB model for $299 and 64GB for $399, double the storage for the price compared to earlier generations. But that wasn't all. The newest generation had some big design updates too. Users had a lot more options than just black and white. They could choose between silver, blue, pink, red, yellow, and gray, and each one came with a matching wrist strap. And the final update to the iPod Touch came three years after the fifth generation, but the success of the iPhone 6 and 6 Plus seemed to overshadow any iPod release, and the iPod Touch appeared to be fading into the background. Much like previous releases, this model focused on bringing iPhone quality hardware to an iPod and featured vastly improved cameras, an M8 motion coprocessor, Bluetooth 4.1, and improved Wi-Fi connectivity. It did away with the wrist strap, but colors were brighter and the line offered a 128GB option. So it's hard to talk about iPods without mentioning at least some of the controversy that surrounds them. The entire line of products has been plagued with public relations issues ranging from mild to pretty shocking, and the iPod Touch is no exception. To start, all iPods, like iPhones and most other devices from major tech producers, have been accused of overstating their battery life. For instance, 5th gen iPods claimed 14 hours of continuous music, but anyone who's ever owned one knows that that's probably a bit on the high end. The iPod Touch line was given especially harsh criticism for its battery life, which often ran out quickly thanks to energy-intensive apps and games. Apple responded to attempts by users to replace batteries on their own by literally gluing batteries into the iPod's casing. And this has not gone over particularly well among third-party battery replacement companies or individuals trying to get the most life out of their device as possible. Apart from other minor issues with the durability of the iPod Touch, especially with easily cracking screens, the biggest controversy in the iPod line comes from the manufacturing process itself. Apple's primary iPod manufacturer, Foxconn in China, has been accused of labor violations several times over the years. In 2006, for example, they were accused of paying workers less than $50 per month, often for working shifts well over 12 hours. While Apple found that some of these claims were in fact true, they continued to contract with Foxconn for the manufacturing of iPod products. Tensions again rose when in 2010, several laborers committed suicide in the Foxconn factory in China and tapes were leaked that showed workers being beaten. While the majority of iPod Touch models are still manufactured by Foxconn today, Apple does produce a percentage domestically and employs over 10,000 workers in the United States for production. Nonetheless, the issue of outsourced and potentially unethical labor has been one that has dampened the enthusiasm for Apple products in general, although I should mention that Apple products aren't the only ones being produced in this type of environment. As it stands today, the iPod Touch is the only iPod still being produced. It comes in two variants, 32GB for $199 and 128GB for $299, and is still available in a variety of colors with an option for engraving. The software has been updated over the years to accommodate for newer versions of iOS, and the iPod Touch currently supports iOS 11. Announcements about the iPod Touch line are no longer made at conferences and keynotes and are left mostly to the domain of press releases, so it's unclear what the future holds for new generations. 
So while other iPods have failed the test of time, the iPod Touch remains an enjoyable device for using apps, playing games, and listening to music. It stands as a compact, portable, and affordable alternative to the more popular iPads and iPhones that dominate the market, but it also stands as a reminder of the decade-long wave of portable MP3 players that left their mark in the chapters of tech history. So that's the history of the iPod Touch, and if you want to vote for the next video topic, don't forget to subscribe. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.